Happy Wednesday, and welcome to UX and Data. So tonight, you're gonna hear from Melinda Hahn-Williams. Melinda is the chief data scientist at Distillery, which is a predictive marketing intelligence company. Before joining the advertising and marketing industry, she was a physicist developing third generation photovoltaics and graphene transistors at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Columbia University. She earned her PhD in applied physics from Columbia University. So please welcome Melinda. Thanks, Kim. Um, so like Kim said, Distillery is, uh, we're applied data science company, predictive marketing intelligence. What that means is that we use, uh, we use digital behavior and machine learning to help marketers understand and predict what their customers are gonna do so that they can better uh, craft and deliver advertising to those customers. And so, okay, so this is, oh, I have my own slide that has my own Twitter handle and everything on there. Um, so, so what does that mean? Okay, so this is the UX plus data meetup, right? Raise your hand if you're primarily UX, like your job role is mostly is UX, or you as aspire to, for your job role to be mostly a UX, so that's like what really brings you here. R raise your hand if you're more data and the UX makes it fun and interesting and that's why you're here, but you're more, you're kind of more, the data side brings you here. Marketing? Okay, so, so my, my, this is sort of literally my outline, marketing, instead of UX plus data, my talk is gonna be marketing plus machine learning plus UX. So I'm gonna start with just defining the, the business, the marketing business question, who is my customer? And then I'm gonna get deep into the machine learning solution that we have of understanding consumer behavior um, based on our understanding of the internet and how, how people, how humans interact on the internet using neural networks. And then on the UX side, I'm gonna talk about how can you possibly convey that information to someone in a way that's digestible and also hopefully fun and engaging. Um, and there's sort of, throughout this, there's sort of a continuous tension, both in the machine learning side and the UX side in, in this dynamic between information that's really uh, global and broad and sort of covers everything, and then also information that's very local and precise. And so figuring out both sort of what to feed into a model and also um, the more, even more challenging part is how to communicate something when you're trying to communicate across both of those like very far apart scales. Um, so that'll, that'll I'll, I'll end with that, that side of it. So, um, I'm still not even ready to go to the next talk. What am I actually gonna talk about? So I'm gonna talk, um, the actual problem I'm trying to solve. So I'm talking about a marketing problem, and in this case, I'm focusing on consumer segmentation. So this is kind of a classic thing that marketers do. I, I wanna understand the different types of consumers I have and how to interact with them differently. Um, and so the, the classic way to do this involves um, surveys, self-reported data, you recruit a bunch of people, and hopefully you, um, hopefully those people I have slides for this. Oh my, I have to switch slides more often. My thing time's out. We're doing marketing. Who's my customer? This is the classic question, right? I have to understand who this person is so that I can interact with them, know what their interests are, their needs. Um, but of course, every brand knows you don't just have one customer, you have all these different customers. So that's where the segmentation comes in. You need to understand different people's individual stories and how, what brings them to the brand, what brings them to the product in order to understand how to even talk to them and then also where to find more of them, right? So this is like a long-standing staple in market research. Market research is a very old, old industry um, designed to solve this problem. And so you, the, the classic method involves surveys um, and then self-reported data, and you have to kind of rely on the people that you find to be representative and have really good memories and really good introspection and be honest enough that what you can get out of that is, is actually like reliable and you can do something with it, right? Um, so Today, of course, there's different sources of data available. There's like all this digital data that people are, are spitting out left and right. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is our take on how to use that observed behavioral data in combination with machine learning and how we use, we use that to update that classic consumer segmentation. So this is the raw data I'm talking about. At Distillery, all of our data, it comes in the form of these um, behavioral journeys. So there's all these touch points throughout the day. I wake up, I check the weather, I get on the train, I read the news, and throughout the day I'm interacting with different devices um, and, it's, and the, those devices are spitting out these breadcrumbs of the websites I'm on, the apps I'm using, the locations I'm going to, um, and, for, and all of this information without anyone actually recruiting me for a survey or asking me a single question, right? Um, so for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna focus mostly on that website type behavior. 
and what can I do with that? So this is an example of a group of, of users that are um, customers of a particular brand, and in this case, the brand is an indoor fitness uh, brand. So I can take this set of users, and I can look at the websites that these people are more likely to go to. So this group of people is more likely than the average pe person to have gone to one of these websites. And I can start to look at what types of websites there are. There's you know, fitness equipment websites, there's some like cabinet hardware, some remodeling type signals, and so you can start to piece together a picture of what a person, what type of a person is interested in this fitness brand, right? But of course, it's not just that each one of these people is doing all of these things. Different people have different reasons, different things that draw them to the brand, right? So you can start to kind of pull apart different stories, um, and and so this is this starts to get at the need for pulling apart different groups of people. Um, something else I want to point at this po out at this point is already kind of starting to seeing seeing that that dilemma between what should I even share, like even in this talk to you, what should I even show you? Is it important that this customer has gone to spinning.com? If you're the marketer trying to understand how to talk to this person, do you need to know that they went to spinning.com or do you need to know that they went to an indoor cycling products website or do you need to know that they went to an indoor fitness website or just a fitness website? Um, or I can look at another one. Calypso St. Barth.com, do you need to know that they went to that website or that boutique women's clothing or women's clothing or retail apparel? Like what's actually the the right level of granularity to, to communicate? And it totally then there's no right answer, right? That's why it's a difficult question. If this is a if I was selling soft drinks, I would I don't think I need to know that this person's into indoor cycling. Maybe just that they're into fitness is enough to know that they're more likely to want like Gatorade versus Coke or I don't know if those are in the same brand. But it, you get the idea, like the depending on what I'm doing, maybe this brand maybe doesn't care about the actual boutique women's clothing brand, but if you're in the retail industry, maybe you want to know the exact competitors. So already it's, it's difficult to understand exactly how, like, what should be communicated when we start with this super, super rich information of like exactly the, the set of URLs that a person has gone to. It's, it's almost so, such rich, rich information that it makes it even harder to digest it and make it usable. So then, this question of how do I take these people that are all mixed together with all their different stories and pull the different stories apart, if I can find a way to do that that doesn't bring in any of my own biases and what I expect to see, then I can pull apart these different people, understand their individual stories. Um, some groups start to appear like this gamers and tech early adopters um, that was kind of a smaller group and kind of got washed out when I was looking at the whole group, but maybe that's like a really high value group of people that the brand wants to grow. And maybe they can understand that these people are interested in their exercise bike because they like that feeling of leveling up when they're on the bike, or they can help them even design their product strategy as well as like market in places no one would have thought of before, right? So if you can find a way to, to pull apart these stories in a way that doesn't bring in anybody's expectations for what they're gonna see, then you can start to do something really powerful. So what we need is, um, an assumption-free way to do this customer segmentation. Um, and there were a lot, of, a lot of data hands being raised, so I think in this room I can just say this is clustering. Um, so this is, this is unsupervised learning, right? So this means this is a way I'm going to, I'm not gonna ask the data any questions, I'm just gonna lay it all out there and kind of see which groups fall together and, and do my segmentation that way. The way in particular I'm gonna do it is called agglomerative hierarchical segmentation, so, um, or hierarchical clustering. So I start, I take a look at all my different uh, people, and I say, okay, which two are the most similar? Like, first draw lines between all the ones that are most similar to each other, and then draw lines between this, the next sort of sets that are most similar to each other, and keep doing that until I build up this whole nice little tree picture called the dendrogram that gives me a whole structure of like who's connected to who and who's similar to who. And now once I have this, I can just pick a place to cut it. So if I cut it there, I, it falls into three nice little groups. If I wanted more, I could cut it lower. And it's like all very organized to give me all the information I need about who's similar to who, right? So I have this perfect little assumption-free segmentation. Okay, but there's something important that I kind of glossed over. What's the catch? So I'm looking at people um, I'm doing this based on people's websites, right? And so, what does my data actually look like? It actually looks something like this. So I'm looking at a space of, of tens of millions of different UR individual URLs, right? And then what I'm looking at is, did you go, this is one way you could represent the data, is for every single user, 
the users are rows in this case. And so for every single user, did you go to URL number one, number two, number three, all the way through 10 million? So this is a huge set of data, but it's mostly zeros. It's very, very sparse. And there's, um, in particular, there's very, there's very little overlap. So it's very difficult to find one user that has anything in common. Like two random users most likely don't have anything in common with each other because this data set is so large and so sparse. So it's really difficult to, to define a distance between two sets of users. So what ends up happening, even if I cut it down, even if I say, OK, fine, just give me the most popular 500,000 websites, just do it at the domain level, don't do the whole URL. Um, still, I tend to have only like 100 web of those websites per user in their history. And like most any two users don't really have overlap. So there isn't really a good distance between them. So in the worst case, what happens is I say, OK, connect the most two similar users. And there's only two that really have anything to do with each other. And then it starts building up this really ugly looking picture that's totally useless for clustering because anywhere I cut it, I get one big cluster and then a bunch of singleton clusters. It doesn't, doesn't teach me anything about, about my people. So what I really need is a better way to um, measure distance between any two users. So if you, if you turned out, tuned out during that, here's, here's the question we're asking. Like, I, it, all the time in meetings, we say, like, we have this cool segmentation method. What I do is I take all your customers for your brand and I look at their full website history and I group the similar users. And like every client is like, awesome. But it's actually really, really different. Like just that question of what does it mean to group the similar users is, is totally non-trivial because how do I measure the distance between any two users? These two users, fitnesszone.com, this one went to a fitness website, a running website, the other one to spinning and gym source, um, the other one to a building and authentique where you can buy a nice teak. So um, from this view, like, all of them have zero to do with each other, right? Because they have zero overlap. As a human, I can look at this and say, probably the fitness people are related. But how can I, how can, okay, the question, I already put it up there in red and told it to you four times. How do I measure the distance between any two users? That's the goal. So what I need is a better way to represent the internet. Like what, what's, how can I better capture what someone's internet history is? I need to understand the internet better. So, okay. So we can go to other domains. So. Um, word embeddings is something that's worked really well as a way to make use to understand uh, language. So you, understand, you get these word embeddings where you have a space where any two words that are really similar to each other are closer together in this space. So the way it works is you have, um, this is a picture of something called a, a word to vec. This is a basic word to vec um, model. It's a neural network and its job is to predict, given a set of words, what's the next word. And as an intermediate step in this process, it kind of spits out this information of um, encoding of what the words mean based on, like it's, it's a space where all the words sit in a space and closer words are, have more to do with each other. So there's a little example here like, um, you know, man and woman are really close to each other, king and queen, queen are close to each other, and then even their relationship matters. Um, this is all just like screenshotted directly from like the, the first tutorial you can find on how to do this by the people who invented it. Um, so this works really well as a way to understand words and put them into space and be able to measure distance between any two words, right? So maybe we can do this with websites. So um, the problem is language makes sense, right? So this, that, this model is, is founded on this idea or built on this idea that if I have a set of words and I'm trying to predict which word comes next, there's some reason to that and some patterns to that. But people tend to not have sentences that are just like, random sequences of words, but the internet is like a total mess. Like someone's internet history can look totally random. So this is some pictures of real internet history um, from a set of users. And you can see that sometimes the sequence of websites actually makes sense, like three websites right next to each other that all have to do with hairstyles. Um, but a lot of times it's total garbage and the websites next to each other have nothing to do with each other. So kind of have this question, like I was always taught garbage in, garbage out. Like how am I gonna be able to just take did this garbage and get anything meaningful, will it work? So it does. And the fact that it does is kind of crazy. Like, so it's like I was able to take just, I have garbage, but I have so much garbage. Like I have just dump trucks and dump trucks of garbage that the, the nuggets of things in there that actually do make sense. Like sure, there's a lot of noise and a lot of things are random, but the small amount of things that make sense are, are consistently make sense. So if you feed it, enough of this mostly garbage, this model is able to find the nuggets of things that actually do make sense. So we built this model and we ran 15 billion websites through it and it took 
a couple of weeks, and we waited. And then when it was done, we had a picture like this um, of, of uh, let's see, this was 50,000, I think, websites, the top most popular 50,000 websites that covered 95% of people's browsing history. It was actually in not two dimensions, but 128 dimensions, and we sort of flattened it so that it would be possible to show it on a screen. And it, is, it works. Related sites are nearby each other. So in that last example where I had the hairstyles websites, like they're all in that spot on this, in this website embedding, and they're all right next to each other. So I can take this and I can just do simple k-means clustering and, and find, like identify which websites are near each other. And what I get are these really tight clusters of websites that actually have a lot to do with each other. So if I zoom in, and by the way, this is another one of those examples where you're looking at the whole big picture, you get a sense of the scale and you get a sense of how much is going on and how things are clustered, but like nothing in it is meaningful because you can't see what these websites are. If we zoom deep into that box, um, so this is just this sort of salmony pink cluster um, the websites in it are not just about travel, but they're specifically about travel where you're kind of trying to optimize how much things cost and get your points to work out really well. And then the next cluster over is not just about travel, it's about travel on cruises specifically. And then the next cluster over is not just about travel, but it's about travel for like planning destination weddings specifically. And uh, the next one is, is not just about travel, but it's about touring and exploring like a, this, this particular flavor of travel. And I can get like, you can get sucked down deep into this thing and just keep finding, oh, and this web's, oh yeah, I never, didn't this makes sense. And you get in it long enough, you find corners of the internet you never knew existed. And it's like, you learn all kinds of things about humanity. <laughs> but it's like, it's like this, the, the thing that blows me away about this is no one, this, no one read any of these websites. Even the model didn't go to any of these websites and look at any of the text on these websites or like consider what the URL was. This is entirely based on just human behavior, on just looking at who went to one web, what website after what website, and we get this whole, it's, it's a map of the internet. So every, every website has a space on this map, and we can find, we can point to it, and the things that are nearby it make sense. So once you have a map of the internet, there's a ton of things you can do with it. Um, so first of all, it's just it's a taxonomy of what the internet is about, right? So if I go back to that that first um, picture of the the Lego people and what they were interested in, instead of spinning dot com, com, if I want to know that it was a indoor fitness website, I don't have to go type it in as a human and understand what it is. I can look where is it on the map of the internet? Oh, it's in the indoor fitness section. Cool, that's what it is. Um, so it's it makes. It makes that fine grain um, information on the internet that much more consumable because you can connect it to the next level up and the next level up or the next level up. Um, you can also use it as a way to describe groups of people much more easily because rather than saying uh, these people did this and it was different, these people did spinning and then these people did otherfitness.com and it was different, you can say, oh no, all of that was fitness. This group as a whole is more likely to do fitness stuff than another group. So it makes it much more easy to just like have a way to describe a group of people. Um, what else you can you do? You can use it, you can feed um, like a supervised classification or predictive models with it because that now you have like a smaller dimensional space, just, just this clustering. So now I have 800 um, dimensions instead of 10 million. So that's nice. That makes it easier to train a model. Or I said this thing is in 128 dimensions. I can use that space and that makes it easier to train a model. So it's, it's a way, this whole process, um, the 15 billion websites in two weeks spent to train it, in that time, it took all of that information and organized it for me, so now I can use it for other things that much more effectively. And in this case, so what was our goal in the first place here? We wanted to be able to find a way where we could measure the distance between any two users. So this is gonna give us a way where any user can have a position in a space and we can measure their distance to another user. So how does that work? So first of all, this, is, this happens in 128 dimensions. Um, no one is actually no human can like actually think of 128 dimensions, but if I draw three dimensions, you can pretend that you're thinking of 128 dimensions. So this is 128 dimensions. So picture this as 128 dimensions. And I have this map in 128 dimensions. Every single website has a spot in this 128 dimensional space. So if I think about what one user's website history looks like. So this is a user, they only ever went to four websites. Um, in that original representation of the website history, they have like a 10 million dimensional vector that only has four non-zero entries in it. But in this case, 
I can look at the four websites they've been to. I can just take the average. So here's their average position in this space between these four websites. And now this person has a location in this space. And then if there's another person that has a different location in this space, I can measure the distance between those two locations. And now I have a distance between every user and every other user, which is exactly what I wanted, right? So I can take that, and now I can get back to my nice, pretty dendrogram, and I can do that nice clustering. Um, so, ooh. Do I have another slide? No. So I'm going to go, I want to show you how, I want to prove to you that this actually works and makes sense. So I'm going to show you um, a case study about that we did for a client that was introducing um, a non-dairy milk and wanted to understand who might be interested in non-dairy milk. So we took the set of people that had expressed interest in this product, we'd gone to their website, we, we did exactly that process, took all the users, put them on 128D space, looked at their distances, made that whole dendrogram, and we got this dendrogram that had seven or something different clusters, if you cut it in the right spot. Um, one cool thing was right off the bat, two of them had nothing to do with their customers. It was like a bunch of like market, it was like us essentially trying to like help them sell. And then, then one right next to it was their competitors or like industry people reading about them in industry magazine, food industry type people. So like, okay, like, Already, like, if we hadn't done this, we would have been trying to sell to those people. So, like, we got them out. Um, and there was a tiny one that was, like, people who weren't in the U.S. And now we have these, these four that are left. Um, one cool thing for them was that we found four groups of people, and then we looked at what those people were up to and, you know, where they sat on the map of the Internet. And we found that um, one of them was sort of obviously really interested in food and, like, how to eat. And the other three had different things going on, different reasons why they were interested in this. They were, like, hip and cool and trying to do the latest cool things so in three different ways. So, so right off the bat, that was kind of interesting. Um, right now, I'm going to focus on the first one, the, the health knot, the one that was more interested in food. Um, and, then, and this is, like, that zoomed-in view where I'm giving you literally the websites they're going to. But if I look at that group, um, these people are interested in vegan stuff. They're interested in how to eat vegan food. And there's just like all the websites that they over-index for are just all about, you know, vegan yak .com, like vegan, the full of plants.com, elephantastic vegan. So vegan, 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 vegan. Okay, that's not that surprising. It's like a non-dairy milk product. Um, so I didn't really want to bring this to the client and say, your customers are vegans, where's my check? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I went back to the denogram and cut that vegan group one, one group deeper. And then, so I found these three separate groups. Um, the first one is super interested in nutrition and ingredients and like what's in the food. And so there's like professional nutritionists in there. There's people like looking at, at vegan food substitutes for foods that they eat. Um, there's a lot of pictures, some pictures of food. None of them look very delicious. Um, and there's a lot of focus on like what is actually in the food. The second one was, um, now this is people who are, who, now we're back to vegan, 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 like how do I cook vegan food? I need to eat vegan food, what can I eat? How do I eat it, how do I cook it? There's pictures of food that start to look like a little more tasty now, and it's just all, it's like almost all recipes and like how do I cook vegan food? And then the third one um, I thought was super interesting. The third one is, again, all about food, but from a totally different perspective. It's all about like wholesome, goodness, organic, beautiful, family, so culture, like a totally different view on food. It's really not vegan food. There weren't a lot of vegan specific websites in here, um, but it was like a very specific take on food where you can imagine what would draw those people to this non-dairy milk pro product um, in a way that's very different from what would draw, you know, that first vegan egg group of people to, the, to that same product. Um, so, and one other call out here, all of the pictures that I'm showing on these three sides, these are all um, screen captures from the websites here, um, which I bring up because it's back to this problem of like, how do I represent the, in, like I'm, I'm showing you the individual URLs, but you don't know what kateandcarmel.com is unless you go to it, because it's not that common, but if I show you like a bunch of screenshots, you can get kind of a, a broad sense of what's going on here without going into that fine, deep level, right? So, so we took this, we started with this representation of humans on the internet, and we were able to, to find this, to, to break down vegans into three different types of vegans and like how they might actually be interested in this product. So now I want to get back to, right now, I said I wanted to talk about how to convey a map of the internet. And right now what we have going on is a 2D bunch of dots that I'm telling you, I put in 3D and told you to pretend is 128D. So I think we can do a little bit better than that. So 
Um, OK, so what does the internet look like is the next question. So there's lots of different, lots of different people have tried to make lots of different maps of the internet, um, conveying very different types of information. So you can get like a, a strictly geographical view on a map of the planet, of looking at just where the fiber cables go and like physically where does the internet go. Um, most of the pictures that I found when I was looking for maps of the internet are something like this, like, like they're topological pictures of, of literally networks. So there's like computers and things connecting, com like lines connecting to the computers was a really common thing. So it's again sort of like physical transfer of information and how is it laid out, like how does this information move around. Um, some of them are really beautiful. So this is this right hand one. I just, I mean, really cool pictures. Really cool pictures, I don't really know what it's of, but it's beautiful. And then there's some pictures that are um, more about the actual traffic. So like how many people are going to each of these websites and, um, and like what's the, this one, the distances have to do with how much traffic is going between those websites and that's how they figure it out. Oh, and then something else I wanted to call out was just, again, that, that difference between going um, broad and going very narrow. So in this one, um, it's interactive and you can zoom all the way into individual websites and you can probably, you can't really see, this one is meetup.com and this one is like newyorkmag.com. So you can kind of go down to, you can go either at the full view where all you see is something pretty and like Google and Yahoo, or you can go all the way down to where you see, thank you, <laughs> to where you see all those individual things. Um, this is one that is capturing still another type of information. This is what is the topic of the website. So I know you can't really read it, but each of these words is like arts, business, computers, games. It's like a topic of a website. And again, this one, you can zoom deep in and see like individual websites. Um, and the XKCD versions, I really just have to put up here because if I try and talk about maps of the internet, I don't put it up here, then everyone's gonna be like, what, where's that? You know there's an XKCD one, where's the XKCD one? So there's an XKCD one also, it's pretty cool. Okay, so what's, what's our goal for our map of the internet? First, what information is it that we're trying to convey? So rather than having like act the nodes are computers and there's lines that are connections, what we're trying to show here is, is websites and the similarity of those websites. And so that's what's already been captured in the version that I've showed you so far is each, on this picture, I don't know if I said, each individual dot is a website and then the distance has to do with how similar those websites are. Uh, the one other piece of information that I would love to be able to capture is audience behavior. And I haven't been able to show you so far anything that captures it within the same picture. So like when I was talking about, you know, the people with the, the um, home fitness equipment brand, I, I'd love to be able to show where those people are on the internet, like what they're doing, where they're traveling, where they're hanging out on the internet, on the same picture of, as like a map of the internet to get that, to convey that in a visual way, like on the map rather than this, this is just a picture of just the internet itself without like a specific brand involved, right? So that's the information that I wanna be on there. What are the sort of goals and design considerations that I wanna have here? So, so a map by its very nature leaves out information, right? If you showed everything, now you have a, I don't know, you have a photograph, you have something other than a map because it's like, you, the, the point of a map is to, abstract the information you want and hide the information that you don't need at the moment. That's not relevant, right? Um, and, and any map, um, not just my map, has this conflict between I want to be able to show fine-grained information and you want to be able to like also see the whole thing. And so with a paper map, like you can do this and it helps, but like also, um, the, so the Google Maps, you know, you can zoom in and zoom it in and you get more information. Uh, for in my case, I want to be able to show that information at the URL level and like get that specific specificity when I need it, but I also want that sense of the whole internet and how are things connected on the whole internet and what's very different and very similar on the whole internet. Um, and so, so yeah, so Street View is actually an example of like a very, you can, you can switch to like a completely local view or you can be like on a broad view where you see everything. Um, and then context, so I wanna, I wanna be able to look at something and get what it means, right? So one, one of the reasons I like this picture is, you know, you have these labels like, you have specific, where specific things are that you might need to know, but then you also have this broad like, Chelsea, Greenwich Village, Koreatown. So there's, there's like sort of these context markers and signposts of like, like telling you more broadly what this area is in addition to what specific things are. 
and um, allow for exploration. I mean, ideally, it should be fun. It should draw you in, and it should give you that sense of, of discovering something. Um, the way when I was like deep in that first picture of the internet, and I was finding like this travel site, this travel site, this travel site. I want to be able to drive that feeling of like finding new things, and ideally even be able to drive it for my client, right? About their 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 customers. Oh, they're, they're into this, and they're into this, and this is kind of related, and there is that makes sense. But this is way over here, and they're into this. I didn't know about that. So to be able to drive that sort of exploratory feeling, to discover something and sort of um, learn something new in in that exploratory way. So this is one view. It's almost the same view as the view that I showed you before, but now this one is 3D. So we can, it's, it's moving around. Um, there's an interactive view where you can mouse it around. So you can kind of get a sense of, I like it because it gives more of a sense of scale and it kind of gives you a feeling that maybe you could go into it and that things are related. Uh, what I don't like about it is I still don't know what it means. I still can't, I, I see that there's lots of dots and that there, some are near and some are far, but I don't know when those dots are. Um, I don't know what it has to do with my customers or my brand, um, but it, it looks pretty cool. And in, in some ways, it's more, if not engaging, it's like a little bit more intriguing than the, than the flat view of the same thing. This is a view um, where I've, unfortunately, the, I, there used to be an interactive version, but I don't have it um, loaded up right now, where now it's still 3D. Now we're sort of inside of it. And um, I think we've only limited to like the very most popular websites, not every single website. And, but it has this extra layer of context. So every website, um, we went and we had a, a crawler go to the website and get a screen capture from that website. Um, and so every website we can kind of see, we're sort of seeing the internet all around. So it has that sense that you can like go, you're in the internet, you can explore the internet and you can see what the different websites are. Um, if you were at some corner of the internet that was like very, you know, you'd be able to, to just like look around and notice you were someplace different just by kind of the context of what you see. Totally different view, like on the other extreme of like very local and with like a lot of context versus like a large view with no context. Um, another view, let me pause this for a second. Um, so this, this view is, it starts out like the view that you've seen before where we're looking at this flat view. Um, there's a lot less dots you'll notice. That's because instead of showing every single website, we've, we're just showing clusters. And I think it's a, it's a much smaller number of clusters here. It's maybe 50 clusters or something like 200 clusters. And so every one of these dots is a, is a set of websites. And then now we've layered on that, that customer inf information. So we're going to see like highs and lows where my customer spends a lot of time there versus doesn't spend a lot of time on there. So. You can kind of move it, you can kind of, once you get it slanted, you can see the 3D-ness like sort of cityscape view. And as you mouse over it, it tells you what that cluster is all about. And so you can have a sense of where your customer is spending more or less time. Um, this was an interactive version where you could pick a different customer or a different brand, I should say. Um, the side view here is because we were kind of thinking, could this be a bar graph? Like, what would it look like if I looked at this from a plane and now it's a bar graph? But if I look at it from the other side, it's like, a different kind of a graph. And so I like, I like this, I like the exploratory feeling in this, um, and I like that it captures the information about the brand. Um, I do wish, like it's sort of stuck in that, in that cluster view, like I'm not able to get down to that super granular view, but it still does a lot in terms of it contains, um, it, hits, it hits, checks a lot of the boxes. This one, so we made an artificial real, uh, augmented reality app. Oops. So now, again, each ball is a cluster, um, and each and the color of the cluster of the balls have to do with the the brand. So if it's blue, then the customers, the clients, spend more time there. The customers are going to spend more time. If it's red, they spend less time. Um, and so it's, I, it has that sense, you can see the whole thing, you can go in and explore, and now you can click on one. The little dots that appear are the actual, the individual websites, and then you get some words like vegan animal rights or healthy, like all three of the, I think the other one was gluten free, so you can see this all kind of relate to each other. And then I can go into a different neighborhood of the internet, and now this is real estate, New York City, New York furniture, so you can see things that are nearby each other are related. Um, and then now let's go into a red zone where they don't spend time. And this is 
free cat videos. So like all actual parts of the internet are on here someplace, right? And so this is this has got a lot, right? It's got you can see the whole thing, you can explore, you can zoom in. Uh, you don't get complete information at the URL level, but at least you get to kind of see where those dots are to get a sense of a little more. And you get the keywords for that cluster, so you understand what that cluster is about. Um, we layered on the, the brand's information, um, and then now you can explore. So this was a really, and it's just fun and looks really cool. Um, I'm so, I tried to load it on this phone before I came here, but I just upgraded my operating system and it won't work anymore. I'm so bummed that I couldn't like, let you guys play with it live, but it's really fun to play with. Um, this, it, it does have sort of like one big downfall though, this version, which is that you can't just like have it on your website. Um, so this is the version that we actually have on our website currently. So you can go to app.distillery.com and you can play with this, with this for like a set of audiences. So this is that same, so now each one of these dots is a set of websites, it's a cluster of websites. Uh, if the dot is bigger, that means there's more people that go to that cluster. If it's smaller, fewer people go. Um, and then the color has to do with a specific um, audience and how much time they spend in that area of the internet. So in this view, red is hot and blue is cold. So if it's red, a lot of people go there. And this particular audience is the crochet enthusiasts audience. So this is, tells us, gives us information about what crochet enthusiasts are into. Um, and then, so here's a screen grab. You can go click on a cluster and you can see like what it's called and you can expand and see exactly what the URLs are that are in that cluster. Um, and then you can, you can even, if you want more context about like what the neighborhoods are, you can have it split into a set of different little balls and you click on something else and it tells you like what each of those little balls are. So um, this is the version that I made in case that didn't work. And so, uh, so this is crochet enthusiasts. And you can see they're really into cooking and DIY. Um, they're like less into auto and hobbies. Um, you can kind of see, you can get a sense like at this broad level of what they're about, or you can click into these dots and see what more what's going on. Just for contrast, this is fishing enthusiasts, just to sort of, so that you believe me that different audiences have kind of different views, right? And then this view is actually the brand's homepage of this um, indoor fitness equipment brand. So I could have, instead of showing you this view that was like a list of websites, I could have given you this view um, on the map of the internet, with, with this little extra layer of, of uh, interactivity where I can click on a red dot and it tells me CrossFit and obstacle race enthusiasts. So, um, okay, so since this is a UX talk, I made the last slide as ugly as possible and dumped everything on there at once and make you deal with it all at once. There's kind of a temptation in this kind of, in this kind of like, um, this last chunk where I was talking about the maps, there's a temptation on my part to to present it as like a journey where like we learned this and we learned this and we learned this and then in conclusion this is the answer and we're all done and we're gonna go home now. But that's like, that's obviously not true. Each of these versions has things about them that are, are really nice and that are, you know, pros and cons to each of them and it's never quite finished. If you work in tech, you know this, like it's, we're always gonna be um, improving it. So um, definitely I would love to hear anyone's thoughts on like, what they think about these versions, what else we could do, how you would make it more engageable or check more of these boxes all at the same time. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Hi. Um, so when you were talking about um, measuring the distance between two users, I was thinking, uh, do you think it's a good idea that we choose or bring in new factors that might seem unrelated uh, to our like human mind? For example, when you're uh, trying to figure out uh, the behavioral um, model of uh, fi related to fitness, mm -hmm. for example, we use cat person, dog person. So right. we we bring this new element and we see that okay, uh, two users might not have any. Um, overlap mm -hmm. regarding the fitness, but we see that cat, cat people go to these certain uh, fitness um, mm -hmm. centers, 
dark people go to another, and then within those we can find. Um, oh, it's another way to connect to that, like yes, some or, extra I mean, step. Or how many? If if we do that, how yeah. many factors do you think we can maybe we we bring in um, hundred factors, for uh -huh. example, uh, where they buy their clothes. Mm -hmm. So based on that, uh, we cluster them, and then within those cluster, we we find. Yeah, that I. The, the idea, I really like the idea that we shouldn't, we shouldn't pick, or we will be limited, uh, the extent that we have to pick in advance what we're going to use as the, attribute, as the attributes, the more we filter ahead of time, the more limited we're going to be, right? So something I really like about this approach is that it's, it's pretty blind to what our expectations are. We sort of throw everything in, um, even though actually sometimes it looks like total garbage, we throw it all into the pot and stir it up, and then if those... I think the way it would work for something unexpected like that is if that's going on in the data, we, we'd we be able to go in afterwards and say, oh, did you know that actually a really determining important thing is this cat person, dog person, like you didn't expect it, but once I threw everything in and kind of let it happen as it happens, then that bubbles out and I can learn something new because I didn't bring those expectations to the table. Can you give me some examples as to how companies are using insights like distilleries um, to their advantage, whether it's the indoor mm -hmm. sports equipment, or I think I saw Louis Vuitton up there, mm -hmm. or even I, myself, I work for GE Power, so we're looking at like um, Siemens, other competitors mm -hmm. that are creating gas turbines, aeroderivative turbines, mm -hmm. wind, wind turbines, things like that. Yeah, so the way, do you mean like, like how it's used in general, or specific things that people, like specific What are stories? some positive, ac yeah, like could you yeah. give me an example of a positive um, outcome someone had by, taking like by taking these insights what are their mm -hmm. actions as a result of it yeah so i mean in the in the non dairy example just to keep it to what i showed here there's they were actually very interested in not just their expected customers but their unexpected customers and so they they're able to use that both to understand what like what to say to them what what the messaging should be based on what they're interested in and then also separately where to find them so like another even layer here that I didn't show is is we we identified those different groups of people we we can say i kind of talked a bit about how we can say what they're interested in we can also go and say in physical space where do they tend to happen so if you want to put up a billboard so there's a company that likes to do out of home advertising you want to put up a billboard we can actually tell you like the person that's really into the nutritional stuff is here, but the person that's actually just wants to look cool is here. And so the, you know you can actually guide your physical placement of at home advertising that way. Um, on the, at the same way, if I back up a step, the two categories broadly are what to say to them, and and like how to say to them what is it creative, and targeting like actually reaching them. And so the out of home example is an example of like physically targeting them where they are. You could also target them digitally since we identified exactly what it means to be the particular type of into cool things Don Dairy person that is the one we're talking about. We can hook right into all the, the digital activations without losing anything in translation and then get the view of actually on top of that. Now that I'm talking to them, what should I say to them? Identify niche then the Exactly, yeah. Hi, at a, from a data collection perspective, I guess one, how are you going about collecting this data? Um, are you tying it back to customers based on IP address? And then what is the coverage like at the individual user level? So it's, the, the website data is based on browser cookies. So it's, as far as coverage, it's basically anyone who's not clearing their cookies um, is, we see this type of data on them. And then if they're not clearing their cookies, the way that we get that data from them is broadly two sources. One, through, um, through ad-supported inventory. So when someone goes to a website that's serving an ad, that website sends a signal saying, this person's at this website right now, do you want to show them an ad? We can collect that and kind of and see that as a signal for they, they went to that website. And then there's also licensed so sources that you can buy on non-ad-supported sites. There's some you know, web development tools or widgets or something that they've placed on that site to do some functionality within that site. And in exchange, it shares information of like this cookie went to this site at that time. So we have these two views of different parts of the internet and we can see, we, can, we get that view with timestamps. A great presentation. I really loved uh, the not automatic, so the automatically linking things you wouldn't necessarily link together. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I noticed though is that you had category names 
Yes. Um, so I'm curious, were you using um, like the, the website's custom meta information for that, the most derived words on the page? Uh, like, yeah, I'm curious how you yeah. automatically categorize them. That's, that's a really good question and actually a really good um, suggestion. So um, we, the, the, the answer at the end of the day is humans went in and named them, the categories. Um, the step right before that was we went and to the websites and got that meta information, that, that meta tag information. And if, if you notice in some of these versions, um, like in the one where with all the bars that were high and low and in the artificial reality one or augmented reality one, you saw instead of like a, a nicely curated name, it was just a few keywords. So that was the thing that was scraped directly from the site. And then in the more finalized version that I'm, it's showing up on our website, a human has gone in and actually named it something that, that makes sense and gotten rid of the ones that were fully inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentation. Um, I apologize in advance for the needl needlessly complex or technical question, but Good. did you maintain ordering in before you did the word to vec transformation? And do you think that that, how do you think that impacts what that's, your that's, definition of a map is? That's a good question. We did, um, so that, so what we're throwing in to the word to vec is the sequence of, of websites that individuals went to, like we take one person's full history and then stick on it, the next person's full history, and then the next person's full history. Um, and one thing that we haven't tried, um, a knob we haven't tried turning, but I, I'm curious what it would do is, is I don't know how much it matters that the website was visited immediately after the next website, or if you could relax it and, and say, and look at you know groups of 10 websites or any website that was in the same day without looking at the exact same order. I sort of suspect that that wouldn't make that much difference to look at one day um, versus in exact sequence, but the way that we, we happen to have done it so far is the exact sequence. Are you targeting all users on the internet, basically, whoever sign on, or how do you decide which ones you should follow? So in the case of, of trying to understand the customers for a brand, like if we're saying, I want to understand the, the customers of that indoor fitness brand, I'm looking at the, the users who went to that indoor fitness brand's homepage. And so I'm looking at them, and then I'm looking at, at what they're doing on the internet. Uh, if, you're, if you're saying, how do we build the thing in the first place, I said, we're, when we're looking at the 15 billion just sequence of things, that is sort of everyone we have access to, which is basically everyone who's um, browsing and, and has a cookie on their browser. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. I'm curious to follow on his point are you getting permission from that brand in order to observe their users? Yeah, so anything that's like, anything that's specific to a brand, it's because the brand is our client. So they've, they've put something on their page that lets us have that view into the people that go to their site. And then once they do that, we only share it. You notice every time it's a specific brand, I'm like vague about who the brand is. So once they've done that, we only share it with them. Um, we don't make it public. We don't share it with the competitors. We don't share it with other brands. So everything that's for that is for a brand that's a client that's giving us their data is is kept sort of siloed just for them. I, I, this is sort of I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this question, but um, in terms of like the information that you find out, like are there always like surprises or do they sometimes they say like well we already knew this and like yeah. well, where does it fall and there are, is there a range like that, that's a that's a good question um the one funny thing is that there's kind of a right answer like if it's if we come back to them and we say like okay your customers are vegans like where's our check like it's obviously not useful to anyone and if we come back to them and we say okay, every one of your customers like owns a cat and it doesn't make any sense, like then it, it also is it's kind of a problem. Um, and, and usually it does, like I think inherently there is always something unexpected because you can't know everything in advance and we're running, we're using a technique that is inherently unsupervised and, and we don't bring our biases. So there's, there is, we're always gonna learn something new unless we actually, like we somehow omnisciently knew everything already. And then there's always something validating People are so predictable. It's a crazy. I've learned one thing. I've learned is like how consistent people actually are, and so you always actually see patterns that are really consistent and really make sense. Um, the funnest ones are ones that you didn't realize were going to make sense until you see them, and you're like, oh yeah, of course. Like people who like that, like fancy beverages, also like fancy coffee shops. Or I, that's not a very good example, but like. <laughs> So they're sort of they're sort of like the funnest ones for me are the ones that are like make perfect sense and are also validating. But then there's always something where 
Um, something that happens a lot, actually, is I think it might be garbage, and then we show it to the client, and they're like, oh, no, that makes perfect sense, because we have a location over here, and all the people who really love cats, they go straight here. And we're like, oh, good, <laughs> cool. So it's, there's, there's always a balance, and that's kind of, that makes it fun. All right. Thank you very much, Melinda. Thank you. Uh, also, um, our next meetup will be next month on March 6th. Uh, we'll have one called Design versus Data Battle Royale. Who will win, an A-B test or a designer's gut? Revenue gains <laughs> or usability wins? You'll have to show up to find out the answers from product designer Jess Dale. So we'll have that uh, next month on March 6th, and you can sign up now on Meetup. So uh, stick around for a little while longer, network, uh, have another slice of pizza, maybe find your next job, and we'll see you again next month. <laughs>